Hello there, you're watching Breaking Views on NDTV. I'm Maha Siddiqui. Xi Jinping is now well and truly the supreme leader of China. His unprecedented third term as party chief. The next step, the legislature clearing his third term as president in March remains a mere formality. What makes him even more powerful is his vice-like grip now over both the party and the country. The top men in his party, in the standing committee, are all Xi loyalists. From Li Qiang, who will be the next prime minister, to Zhao Leiji. They all have his confidence. They will execute decisions made by Xi Jinping. There will be no challenge and no successor either. That uh, he has amassed power is clear. But this brings us to the question, what is he going to do with this power? How will this power play out for India and the world? What should India be watching out for as it continues to deal with a difficult neighbor over the boundary question? That's our big story this evening, which we will be discussing with our panelists uh, who are joining us now, Lieutenant General S.L. Narsiman, member of the National Security Advisory Board, Lopsang Sange, former Sikyong president of the Tibetan government in exile, and Ainar Tanjin, political analyst and economic affairs commentator based in Beijing. But before we dive into that discussion, here's a look at some of the reasons why India has had a difficult time over the last couple of years in dealing with the dragon. The removal of a former leader, the deposing of a close ally, the elevation of a cadre of yes-men. China's 20th Communist Party Congress had it all. And by the end, Chinese President Xi Jinping had secured an even tighter grip on power. The 20th Party Congress was defined not only by this, but also by the dramatic proceedings. Xi announced a shake-up in his 24-person Politburo, which for the first time since 1997 contains no women. This group, which is a centralized decision-making committee within the Chinese state, is headed by Xi Jinping now. It's also stacked with Xi's people. But what can India expect from a politically more powerful Xi? Well, geopolitical experts say very little is likely to change in the current state of India-China relations with New Delhi, insisting on a resolution of the situation in eastern Ladakh arising from China's transgressions of 2020, targeting Chinese economic interests in its jurisdiction and increasing political and security cooperation with the U.S. This as the Chinese party state for its part insists on separating other aspects of the Sino-Indian relationship from the border situation and views the United States of America as its principal challenger and an existential threat. The latter aspect has led to a tendency under Xi to view India as possessing no views or agency of its own and essentially then doing the U.S.'s bidding. This approach suits the CPC worldview because it would otherwise have to contend with India in Asia first before it could fully turn its attention to the US. That, however, would complicate the Chinese narrative of being the latter's successor as the global superpower. But analysts argue that a more powerful Xi focused on the threat from the US but at the same time constrained from acting directly against it could possibly target those he sees as US proxies. This includes India, Taiwan and Japan, among others. There are both opportunities and challenges for India. Analysts highlight the West may finally understand that they need to diversify their investments and markets, opening real possibilities for India in technology collaborations as well as supply chains. Yet geopolitical experts assert we should be aware that as the global economic war turns ugly, our performing sectors ranging from electronics to pharmaceuticals to automobiles are still heavily dependent on Chinese imports and they may use economic coercion to force choices upon us. Parmeshwar Bhava for NDTV. Going to directly to my guest now, Lieutenant General Narsimhan, coming first to you, sir. The Eastern Ladakh crisis has been on for over two and a half years. Will China under an all-powerful Xi Jinping, 
harden its position. Uh, thank you, Maha, for uh, having me on your show. Uh, as you have mentioned, the the Party Congress verdict is very clear that Xi Jinping has come out as for the third term. And as far as the PBSC is concerned, you have mentioned correctly as to how things have changed in the in the present situation. As far as Eastern Ladakh goes, as you are aware, we had insisted on a three-step process of disengagement, de-escalation, and uh, then coming to an understanding of maintaining peace and tranquility along the line of actual control. Out of which, the first part, there is a disengagement from those four areas in which it has the, the, the incursions are taken place at that time. That has actually been achieved. The disengagement process has been achieved. The next one is going to be the de-escalation process in addition to discussing Devsang Bulge as well as the as the uh, Demchok area. Mm -hmm. So these are the issues that are going to be taken up subsequently for discussion. It is going to be a long drawn affair. It is not going to be an easy issue. So uh, as I see it, the in the near future, I don't see a major change unless there is, uh, there is the de-escalation de process gets achieved. And as our external affairs minister stated time and again, the status of the border will determine the status of the relationship. And so that is a prerequisite that we are insisting upon. So does, does China want a better relationship with India? That's the question because as uh, General Simon is pointing out, the external affairs minister has said the situation can't be normal uh, between the two neighbors till the situation in eastern Ladakh is normal. But that also brings us to the question of other uh, aspects that have been sore points between the two sides. Lopsang Sangye, I want to bring you in here, sir. How is this uh, par? that uh, Xi Jinping has now amassed likely to play out for Tibet and indirectly for India, in your opinion? Uh, thanks, Ma Siddiqui, to be on your show. Um, I think we have to look at it from the you know, uh, macro geopolitical uh, point of view. Uh, China is a rising power. And if you study history of you know, rising power or great power politics, rising power wants to dominate First, your region, that's Asia. And then, then they want to take over the world. So I think, in a way, declared or undeclared, China wants to be superpower or number one by 2049. And, and also in the Xi Jinping speech, he has clearly you know, put Taiwan, very important issue, among the most important at the top. Um, and then security, he mentioned it you know, uh, 50 times uh, compared to Kuchinta mentioned it only five times. So clearly, security is very important to Xi Jinping. In that context, China wants to dominate Asia first, and then tension over uh, Taiwan is real, and then China wants to dominate the whole world. In that sense, obviously, border tension with India will continue. And if you look at the general trajectory, China is in the mood of taking everything. They want to take Tibet, Xinjiang, Hong Kong, Taiwan. They're not in the mood of giving anything. So as far as Tibetans are concerned, I believe in middle way approach. But at the moment, for short uh, time, it doesn't look Chinese government wants to give anything to Tibetans. Rather, they want to continue to repress Tibetans in Tibet. Aina Tanjan, much has been speculated about Hu Jintao and that uh, mention uh, uh, of his word, or of his name, sorry, uh, by Lup Sang Sangye brings me to that question. Uh, much has been speculated about how he was asked to leave the Congress proceedings. As some say, picture spoke a thousand words. End of consultative politics in China and a one-man show because we had a picture where Hu Jintao was asked to leave right behind Xi Jinping there. That is the picture that really went viral. Is it that, is it that way now, Aina Tanjin? Is it going to be a one-man show? Well, first off, I mean, I understand everybody has their own narrative. Uh, you started off with a stinging indictment, uh, casting aspersions on China. I don't think they would agree with you. They have their own uh, narrative on that, and that is that they're the ones who invited India to the SCO. They're the ones who are uh, championing uh, RCEP, which uh, India declined to be part of, although it's uh, a multilateral group. 
Um, they would very much, as was said in 2013, uh, as she said in 2013, like to see India and China on the same page. Not necessarily dominated by anybody, just simply equal neighbors. If you talk to any ambassador who is in China, they'll tell you that they're treated with the utmost respect, including your current ambassadors and previous ones. So this idea, this narrative that China is trying to dominate the world doesn't stand to history. Only if it was a colonial power, like in Europe, that, that would be true. They did, in fact, try to dominate each other and then the rest of the world. China's history shows that it doesn't try to do that. In terms of uh, the situation at, uh, with Hu Jintao, this is an elderly man who's 79 years old who obviously has some health issues. I think it's rather cynical for people to try to read into that. Uh, his a little bit of confusion that he was having and his colleagues trying to, in essence, cover for him, not make a big deal out of it. But unfortunately, the international press wants to see in it some sort of push. Um, the fact is he was there to show unity, party unity, behind uh, Xi Jinping's uh, elevation. And there was no question that they were trying to stage some sort of small drama in front of the world stage. Okay. So you are suggesting that this was not uh, out of the ordinary that uh, Hu Jintao was asked to leave. There was some explanation that came in that day as well. You mean out unfair. of the ordinary? That's silly. Of course. I mean, he was, if you take a look at the entire tapes that were there, he had to be helped in. He was having difficulty going through his papers. He's very frail. He had to be uh, escorted out because he was confused. I mean, I, I, wh why would you say out of the ordinary? Is it out of the ordinary for somebody who's trying to you know, show support for something, who has a momentary uh, loss of confusion, and you want to make this into an international issue? Now, this doesn't sound like journalism. It sounds like tabloids. All right. General Narsimhan, was that the reading of the situation? He's saying that uh, it's been read wrongly uh, by the world. Uh, the fact is, Maha, is that, that you know, the, the, the real reason behind how Mr. Suchinta went out of the hall will never be probably be known. The real reason won't be known. There are many analysts who have stated many things. One was about the folder that he had. He wanted to see that folder, and so he had to be moved out. He is frail. He had dementia. Any number of reasons have been given out. It will be extremely difficult for anybody to actually pinpoint a particular reason as to why Mr. Hu Jintao moved out from, of that place. But one thing I'll agree with Mr. Aina, that he doesn't seem to have been in good health. That is something which is clearly visible, uh, visible in that particular video. So to that extent, I think the real reason is not going to come out anytime very soon. So we can keep guessing. But the fact of the matter remains that Mr. Hu Jintao moved out of that hall when uh, that particular proceeding was taking place. That is the way we need to see it. If you can give me 30 seconds, I'll just come back on sure. two issues which, is, which has come up. You, you mentioned that you know India will probably look at the relationship in a different manner in case the Eastern Lada gets resolved. The point that we need to understand is that we are trying to maintain the peace and tranquility along the entire line of actual control and not only Eastern Lada. So that is one point I wanted to uh, clear. The second thing is on the other issues as how China will deal with this in this relationship. Please understand there are two parties in this relationship. It is not only China, it is also India. So since we have made our stance extremely clear that the status of the border will determine the status of the relationship, I think that is the basis on which we are going to deal with this relationship. However, the, uh, the, uh, however China may, may behave on that particular relationship along the line of actual control. We need to be careful on that account. I am sure the armed forces are very clear on this score. Hmm. Lopsang Sange, I had interviewed you in 2020 when the Eastern <clears throat> Ladakh friction had started, and you had mentioned that uh, uh, the five fingers of Tibet is a theory that China will go by, and Ladakh is the first finger they will go after the rest as well. Do you think that under Xi Jinping, to show his authority, that that <clears throat> may perhaps be the uh, path <clears throat> that will be taken? Uh, first, uh, let me you know come a bit on Hu Jintao, his removal. You know, it looks he was frail. Clearly, he had some medical issues. But then the Chinese Communi uh, Communist Party meetings are very well choreographed. Nothing happens without planning, right? 
So when Hu Jintao, the way he was removed, and it looked a bit odd, right? Um, but the, it is getting traction. There could be some other reasons because his protege or the Communist Youth League faction, like uh, Premier uh, Li Kaicheng, Wang Yan, who was 67 years old, were removed, while Wang Huning, who is 67 years old, is kept uh, in the standing committee, right? Now, more mm -hmm. importantly, Hu Chunhua, 59, 60 years old, who was at one time considered a protege or successor to Xi Jinping, was not only removed as a vice premier, but also removed from uh, the standing committee, Politburo as well. So it's a major demotion who is also from Hu Jintao faction. So to see the Xi Jinping faction dominating the power uh, body, but voting and removing you know, Hu Jintao faction gives attraction as to why Hu Jintao was playing with the file and the names and things like that. So that, that's why this, you know, uh, this story is getting attraction. And it, it is not the fault of journalists per se. There is some story, but truth we will never know. But as far as, you know, uh, Xi Jinping is concerned and Tibet is concerned, it's Mao Zedong and Chinese leaders have already said in 1949, 50s and 60s, that Tibet is the palm they must occupy. Then they must go after five fingers, Ladakh, Nepal, Bhutan, Sikkim, and Arunachal Pradesh. From Doklam incident, we know it touched on Sikkim, Bhutan. Right. And then uh, with the Galwan Valley, it touched on, uh, you know, uh, the Ladakh uh, part. Now, Arunachal Pradesh is still a major issue because China refused to call it part of India, but say it's southern Tibet. So hence, you know, border tension doesn't matter how many events or organizations China has invited India into. But if you look at the border tension, it clearly shows that China wants to and wants to and continues to put pressure uh, on India, you know, including by uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping. Anar, you know, considering that there has been an ongoing friction, uh, but during these two years, we have seen the trade go up between India and China, and it, the trade, in fact, is skewed in favor of China. Uh, it's gone <clears throat> up further in the first uh, quarter of this year. Do you think that there is a perception then in China that India hasn't imposed enough cost and that is why China can continue as it is and that's the part Xi Jinping is likely to take? Well, it doesn't seem to make much sense. Yes. I mean, uh, the, the people who buy from China are individual consumers. They're buying because uh, it's less expensive. If they could buy other things, I think they would. Uh, that, that's really not the issue. The trade has grown because of the, uh, you know, the decisions of consumers in India. This is not some plot to make them buy Chinese things. So I never quite understand this idea that mm -hmm. China is somehow using this as a ploy against India. Uh, obviously, trade between countries is good. It would be better if there were things that India could export to China and even out the relationship, I think that would help with uh, frictions. But that is not something that China can do. That's something that India has to do. General Nasiman, therefore, do you believe India has not imposed costs on China, apart from the fact that uh, it is trying uh, to hold back China in eastern Ladakh and go back to status quo ante? In other aspects, enough costs have not been imposed. I think that is not the correct way to look at it. I mean, I am a little at disagreement with Mr. Ayanar on this because basically because of the trade is something which we need to look at. He said India, if India could uh, export more to China, we wish if India, if China could give us more access, the non-tariff barriers, etc., that has been put up and we have been taking it up in a number of a number of years to relax them. That is not happening. And in addition, the reason why the trade is going up is because for on a few sectors, we are dependent on China, and that is the typical demand and supply system that is working. That is not to say that China has not imported more from us. This year, the rice has been imported more by China. So it is basically the demand and supply that is actually working. It is not to say that costs have not been imposed. You see the political relationship is it's almost at a freeze for the last two years except barring a few meetings which, which take place routinely, 
other than that there has been no forward movement on the bilateral relationship even on the uh, other issues like for example the the neighboring countries have to go through a government approval route for investments etc the the impact is very clearly visible so the costs have been imposed the apps have been banned there are a lot of things that have happened in the last couple of years but the fact of the matter remains it is the demand and supply that is still working and to to and it is skewed in favor of china so to overcome that india has announced a production linked incentive scheme which was initially for three sectors now it has expanded to 14 sectors it, it is still in the catching up mode so it is going to take some more time before that that comes into effect so till that time i think the trade uh, trade deficiency with china will will continue and that we need to slowly and gradually overcome that particular process hmm. all right let me now open up this debate a bit further this discussion rather a bit further we have the last 5 minutes left lopsang sange what do you see as uh, the impact of xi jinping uh, becoming the supreme leader the all powerful leader of china uh, we don't know how long his reign will continue because it almost appears he'll be ruler for life what do you see the fallout in indo pacific and on the asean country specifically I think I alluded to that from the very beginning. You know, China wants to be number one in the world, and 2049, that's the 100th anniversary of Communist Party of China, is the target, right? Thereby, if you study great power politics, you know, from the Polonia Polonia nation war uh, all the way uh, till now. I mean, this uh, the you know Alison Graham, the dean of Kennedy School, has come out with a book. of inevitable war which says that out of 16 times when there was great power you know struggle uh 12 times it 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 you know uh, it was uh what it called decided through war so 75% uh, odd that there will be a war so in that context and the chinese government's pressure in asia overall including in india and china will continue and their dominance or claim of the authority around the world will continue Finally uh, let me um you know uh, add this one issue this attention said that chinese goods are cheap so indians are buying it why chinese goods cheap let's look at the high tech you know uh, smartphones and gadgets almost 90% of rare earth which is a essential component is very rare in china comes from inner mongolia right 70% of lithium which is essential for batteries in all the gadgets come from tibet 40% of iron ore comes from Xinjiang right 80% of cotton comes from Xinjiang so thereby when you use these minerals and hundreds of other minerals i'm talking about you know without paying anything to the local tibetans and uigurs and uh, mongols and use it by chinese company by exploiting our minerals and manufacture goods and sell it to the world it will be cheaper so there is unfairness in the way the chinese products are manufactured in china and that is why we have seen uh, some steps that the us has taken aina tangent that has uh, not gone down well with china does xi jinping look at improving relations with the us well i, I think it's the other way around i mean it's uh, there are not chinese warships uh, sailing up and down the east coast uh, it's uh, us warships sailing through the taiwan straits us has put uh, technological embargoes they blacklisted companies uh, there was no reason for, uh, for huawei but they did that anyways i i think it's clearly the aggression is coming from the us side i would like to take this point to agree with my colleague who said that more needs to be done in terms of china opening up to india especially in an area where india is very dominant generic medicines uh, i don't know why that hasn't happened but hopefully that will because we'll ease the the tensions in terms of xi jinping he has his team in there people forget that once you have uh, an agenda which was set by the party and you have your team in there the ball is in your hands and so therefore one party system there's nowhere to hide you know winners want the ball losers want excuses and at this juncture xi jinping has taken upon himself to guide china he has his team in place no question about it so he's somebody who wants to move in a direction let's see what he does hmm 
Lieutenant General Darsiman, should freedom of navigation exercises be seen as provocation? After all, all countries around the Indo-Pacific have been stressing on free, open and inclusive Indo-Pacific. It's a very important link for trade as well. Uh, why shouldn't uh, a movement, free movement be allowed there? And why should it be seen as provocation? See, South China Sea is a, is a, is a global common. I am sure everybody is navigating to that place. The freedom of navigation operations are not offensive in nature. It only ensures that the navigation uh, rights are allowed for everybody in the in the free uh, in a free manner in the global commons. That is the only way that needs to be seen. There are political overtures to this that has been that has been allocated by by China and made made a little issue of it. But the issue that comes up is it is not only there the phone offs are being done. In, there are many other places in which the freedom of navigation operations are undertaken. So that is something which I don't think is a major issue. The major issue is, should there be some kind of an incident which could escalate these issues? Like, for example, the Chinese ships have been seen to be busing the, uh, the, the US ships. They've gone very close, almost up to 40 meters from the other ship. Things like that could actually, if they get out of the hand, then you have a problem on hand coming up. So freedom of navigation operations by themselves are not dangerous but should something go wrong in these issues when somebody else is trying to push the envelope a little bit more that is something that is going to be dangerous in that area all right uh, last uh, 20 seconds left i'll go across to lupsang sange uh, overall how do you see xi jinping's uh, acquiring of power do you think that uh, it will only have ramifications for China or the neighbors, or do you see a larger global ramification? And I want you specifically to uh, talk about Taiwan. Oh, yes, I think uh, Taiwan is the goal. Um, many experts have said by 2027, China would have built its military so overwhelmingly strong that they will in the China will invade, you know, uh, uh, Taiwan. But the, uh, the, the commander of the you know, Pacific um, uh, region uh, of the U.S. has said, to why to 2027? It could be as early as 2022 or 23. I would say maybe as early as 2024, when U.S. presidential election is going on, hmm. when Indian election is going on, when Taiwan would have just elected, most likely, the vice uh, president of you know, uh, DPP, who is you know, deep green, he's pro-independence right. candidate. So by 2024, when he hmm. declares himself elected president, it would be like Zelensky just getting elected in Ukraine and Putin getting nervous, saying, oh, Ukraine is going towards NATO. Similarly, now Taiwan is going towards West America. All right. In that scenario, hmm. it could be a potential conflict. All right. We'll have yes, to I leave can. it at that. Uh, many thanks to all three of our panelists for joining us here on the show this evening on Breaking News.